Hello, I'm State Representative Jonathan Brostoff, and I uh, just wanted to thank everyone who came out for my community conversation on mental health. We had a great opportunity to uh, have some real important dialogue together. And I got some really good legislative ideas out of it. Look forward to having future such conversations, but some of the ideas I got were issues around deaf and hard of hearing uh, access and licensure. A treatment alternative diversion um, opportunities that we can invest in, as well as acute and long-term care issues that we're still struggling with in Milwaukee County, and a myriad of other important issues. So again, thank you so much to everyone that came out. I thought uh, for anyone who wasn't able to be there, you might enjoy seeing the video. So uh, that'll play very shortly, and I look forward to continuing the conversation with you. To speak, but I would just ask that we're being respectful of all the people here today and, you know, keeping ourselves uh, within reasonable bounds. Um, with that, I'd like to get started. So, um, again, thank you all very much, and I'll uh, first have uh, Robert Graff uh, join us and um, take it away. Thank you. Uh, just make a few comments. About 10 years ago, I had a, a son with a severe mental illness who uh, was stopped taking his medicine and he was uh, one night in the middle of the night he was beating on the door of a friend who had helped him but this time the friend was helpless he was hitting the door and tearing it down and so the friend called the police and told him that he needed to be put in the middle back in the hospital where he had come from and uh, the police came and said no because he committed a crime he was destroying the door they had to take him to jail so she called me up and I talked to the police, told him about his history. He still took him to jail and they put him in solitary confinement, which is the worst form of punishment, a treatment for a person in a mental health crisis. Now, we go back today, flash forward today. We have a crisis intervention team with the police force. We have, uh, counties has a special private group that runs the uh, a mental health award in the hospital, in the jail. And we have all kinds of stuff, uh, CART team, this team, we have health complex has contracts out with a number of people in the community for community service. However, I found out this week that the number of people with mental, severe mental health crisis is increasing the last few months and being put in jail. Uh, in fact, they say that 400 of the 960 people in the county jail or the House of Correction have severe mental illness. In the same, 35% or more in the Department of Corrections in the state have severe mental illness. So we're still jailing our sick people. If I suffer from an automobile accident, I have a stroke or heart attack, or even if I get shot performing an armed robbery, I'll be taken to an ER in a hospital. However, if I have a mental health crisis and start acting out, I'm likely to go to jail and be put in a unit. And people in jail stay with mental health crisis stay three to four times longer than a normal person. However, people with mental health issues are less likely to commit crimes than normal population. Yet, they're 16 times more likely to be shot and killed by policemen than the normal population. So we have to stop criminalizing mental illness. It's a brain illness that more and more research has proven that, and we treat all other illnesses with treatment, and we, we have to stop opening up our hospitals, our ER wards, and our, all our community to treat people that are sick, not punish them by putting them in jail and making it worse. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and next we have uh, Cynthia Greenwood. And I'm sorry if I mispronounce any last names. No. Cynthia Greenwood. Hi, you did a good job. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my situation is a little bit sensitive, and maybe you can, I don't know if you can answer any comments now or not. But sure. my son was placed in a facility. He has severe autism. He's like a two year old. Um, he's 19 right now. While we were in these institutions, we finally got a judge after, I don't know how long, to order an aid with him. An aid was supposed to be with my son 16 hours a day. My son was being abused and 
I said, he had holes in his clothes. I have tons of pictures. I ain't bring my pictures, but I can show them to you if you would like. Uh, while he was there, he was being bitten repeatedly over and over. This is not the only child that attacks the, attacks the other children out there. He had a broken toe. Uh, I got the police to go out there only because protective service was going. They felt they had to go. They never told me the results of the report. Nobody was ever charged, but at least somebody should have been charged with, with neglect. My son ended up in Children's Council with a broken bladder. And hear me when I say a broken bladder. That's exactly what it was. Children's Council pulled me aside from the social workers, would not allow the social workers in the room to talk to me because they wanted me to know their suspicions. The doctor told me, ma'am, I've been a doctor for 35 years. I've never seen a case like this. Okay, to this day, we can't get anybody charged. I'm not seeing my son right now, even though they said it was good for me to stay in contact with him, that the visits were good for me and him. I've had all my contact cut off with my son. So my, my question to you, I guess, more point blank is, how do we protect children who have special needs, who are in institutions? A lot of times, I have a support group in my home for children of special needs, and um, I have a support group also for families who've had trouble with CPS, who've had their children removed by CPS. Mm -hmm. So how do we help these children who can't fend for themselves? My son can't fight that. He can't do the phone. He can't do the pencil and paper or laptop or anything. So how do we protect these children? Because uh, the guy out there told me, he said, Miss Greenwood, I can't say anything because this is my job. I said, well, I won't even mention your name. Please just tell me what happened to my son. To this day, I've never got any answers. Never. We finally got a hilltop, I believe it's called, Mm -hmm. closed down. When I talk to somebody, and I would call these people by their name, because I don't have nothing to hide. They have already took my son and cut contact, so I, I have nothing left to fear. Peggy West, I asked her about Hilltop. She said, oh, we don't do that. That's not the county. I talked to Chris Aikley, and guess what? That man had enough decency to talk to me and answer my questions. She just pushed it aside. Mm -hmm. So um, unfortunately for me, um, I had a child who was in an institution. And when I tell everybody here, I hope you listen to my words. He was abused very badly. My child looked like a child out of Ethiopia. The only difference was he didn't have the bloated stomach. He had skin and bones, she could almost see his bones. I begged children to hospital to give him seconds because I talked to Lakeview Rehab Hospital. They said, oh, we don't do that. He can't get seconds here. That's not going to happen. Children's Hospital ordered them to give my son seconds, and he started gaining weight. And then he was in Oconomowoc. Oconomowoc said, we can't handle him. He's too much. My son was a violent. He just had to be watched and supervised. So that's my question for you. How we can protect children in these institutions so they're not mistreated? Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And uh, also, first of all, thank you very much for sharing the story. Um, if it's possible, if you can follow up with my, uh, my team uh, at the door and we can make sure maybe we can sit down one on one and get some more details. Um, and I'd like to, yeah, look into how it can be a help on the micro level. On the macro level, legislatively, you know, that's what we're looking to do here today, see what fixes we can put into place, you know, whether it's at the state or county level. Um, again, we, you know, we do have a county supervisor here, um, but at the state level, there might be uh, some fixes we can put into place as well. And, you know, I think it's uh, an important conversation to have, but, uh, you know, that's the legislative process. We've got to see what the problem is, and we've got to draft legislation to correct it. Um, so again, if, if, you, if it's OK, I'd like to follow up one-on-one, -on -one and um, Will or Stephanie in the, in the front there can uh, get, get the info to do that. OK, and thank you very much. And I also want to say thank you for taking your time to be doing anything else besides meeting with us. But 
Well, thank you for coming out. I do appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, next we have uh, um, Janice uh, Winkowski Rodriguez. And also just um, a quick housekeeping thing. Uh, if we can try to talk into both microphones, I know it's set up a little bit further, um, but it's helpful to get both in there. Thank Hello, you. Hello, my name is Janice Lukowski Rodriguez. I'm representing the, uh, uh, you know, uh, strong confederation nurse professionals. Um, I'm a registered nurse. I've been a registered nurse for 30 years doing, you know, med surge. I worked in the community, um, some home care, and then I ended up as a psychiatric nurse for the last 24 years in Milwaukee County Mental Health. Um, I've worked throughout the hospital, all areas. I've worked in the emergency department where I see people coming in um, broken, needing emergency care, with needing to send to other areas of the facilities before they come back. I've worked the um, triage of a psych crisis line where we coordinate services um, when people feel suicidal and you know, stay alive in that way. I've worked in long-term care, One lady, I mean, one of the issues is um, when you have injuries that occur, I believe it's a staffing issue. You may need more than just one person, or maybe in some, you know, um, you need someone to watch them. You may need at least two people to watch that person, and you need some um, safety uh, treatment plan in place. That's what you're going to do when you see certain behaviors and mm -hmm. interventions. And you do need to work as a team, you need to know about collateral and Regarding, um, you know, so there's some type of calming techniques that can help with some people, and, and sometimes, you know, they need, um, you know, medication as well. Um, so I, I would, and that's, you know, an issue that, you know, uh, we have concerns about too, safe staffing. Um, because without safe staffing, it, uh, you know, it affects the uh, retention and the ability to recruit um, staff at our facilities. I'm concerned about um, you know having maintaining uh, public health, mm -hmm. um, and that's the, you know I was, wasn't sure what I was going to talk about, but I thought maybe what I'll do is I'll just, just talk from my heart and talk to everybody like you're my family and you're my friends. And you know many times people look at health professionals and you might think, oh well, you know what do you know about this? But I and many people that I work with uh, have been personal situations, just as the people that have uh, come up before me, uh, happened in their life. Um, well, my father was a, a vet. Uh, he suffered from PTSD after World War II. And in the end, you know, um, you know, there's trouble even accessing VA uh, mental health for some vets, and I, I see it as well, when they may not be able to get inpatient. Mm -hmm. But my father had taken his own life. Eventually, years ago, it was very difficult. So I know that there's stigma, and I know that there's difficulty accessing care. You know, he's one of those people that really needed inpatient care, not outpatient. And there is difficulty getting people inpatient care for the, the very amount of time that they need. You can't, you can't just discharge them and they're still sick. You know, because people wonder about that revolving door. Why does that revolving door exist? Right. Well, there's, you know, insurance ramifications, and people may not do well enough. And bridging the median uh, at too early on in community is not going to be effective. You know, I, uh, you know, I went to some um, organizations. I had other people that had these issues in my family. Um, you know, I had a cousin that couldn't access care um, because of poverty, not having insurance. <laughs> and you know, so there is a real problem there. Um, I don't think we can't make it difficult. We have to make it easier. <laughs> And um, you know, some of the other things I, I, I'll speak about, the gentleman who said he had a son that went to jail, well, I see people revolving through the system, and they come to us, you know, they go out in the community, they go to maybe a group home or CDR, and they do come back, you know, and they're unstable. I mean, 
stricken again, and I just see people go out to the jail, um, they come back to us, then they go to my daughter, they go to my bagel, and then they go to jail and they come back to us. Now, we had long-term care units, and so people were, um, could be stabilized there, and some of the, you know, sometimes the, the individual that you care for starts circling through that system in that way. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, you know, nobody really wants to um, take care of it for long. <laughs> you want to go to the next facility. But, you know, if you study about anybody with mental health issues or cognitive issues, they do not do well with a lot of change. Mm -hmm. You know, circling through. They, they do better with stability. Um, I think the closures of um, some of the long-term care uh, units have uh, um, impaired progress for some people. I don't know if people have to be there forever, but they have a place where they can stay more than maybe two or six weeks. It's important because we still have you know, individuals coming back that need more extended care. This is a fact of life. You, know, you can't just manage the things and make that go away. And, um, so, uh, you know, I, I, my heart goes out to everybody, and, you know, I, I just pray that uh, we'll build a system that will be effective, and I hope that, you know, the stigma that is uh, for mental health, that we uh, provide more education, and so that people aren't fearful. I wanted to speak about another thing before I close. I know we have community um, clinics, and those are all closed in the north side, the south side, downtown. Mm -hmm. So, something is already working on a, at a helpline. You know, someone needs help, they're going to you know, want to end their life, or they did. And I'm trying to get services to save their life and have the, the paramedics there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, usually a, a private facility will take them, but I have people that, you know, I'm trying to get services, and then uh, a private hospital will take them. I have the police there. Right. And Can you, can you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you um, just go over that, the last piece you said one more time and, and elaborate a little bit, please? Oh, I said I would, I would say more, but um, I signed a code of ethics at the um, Nurse for Behavioral Health Division, not to speak about against policies at the facility at the Behavioral Health Division. So, I so just, to, just to clear. Retaliation for whatever I say. So just to clarify, the new like contractor policy is saying that folks cannot, even on their own time, off the clock, express their First Amendment right to talk about, you know, whatever their thoughts are on whatever subject. That's that's part of this. Just to clarify. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And before we continue, I'm just going to do a quick logistical fix. Hold on one sec. Is anyway, we want to try to get both mics a little closer so we can hear on our side. All right, better. 
Thank you. Okay, next we have uh, Sue Westby, or Westby. S Sue? Uh, yeah, that's. Yeah, yeah, whatever. It is, we just want to make sure we can hear in both. Yeah, thank you. And uh, but we but they both go to different systems. One's for uh, the camcorder, and one is for the audience. So. How's this? Perfect. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and thank you very much. Okay, I will say I'm very nervous. Um, I'm not really sure where to begin. My name is Sue. I'm a mental health patient myself. Right now, I struggle with depression and life factors and financial barriers. One hospital is actually suing me right now. Uh, this past summer, that case uh, started. I felt that my mental health has not improved, I've had increased stress in my life. We have uh, lost our car, we are concerned about losing our home for financial reasons because of that hospital. I felt that the hospital was supposed to support me and I don't feel like they are. And I don't know where to go from here. I feel that I'm very much stuck in a, in a negative place. Sometimes I do have to self-admit and there are not interpreters there so that I can have access, and that's a problem. I did have therapy over the years, but I stopped it because I can't financially afford it. My insurance is limiting me. And I feel that I'm stuck. I don't really know where to go from here as far as my care. I try my best day by day, step by step, and go through what I can. I have stopped working. And I'm still not 100% satisfied with how my life has been going. I'm trying to do what I can to make myself happy, but I must struggle with um, the weather but that's besides the point. Um, Milwaukee is a challenge for me in there. I, I have a lot of stress in my life due to these ramifications, and I don't know what to do from here. So, thank you. Um, and, sorry, again. Um, thank you again, and um, I'm sorry, my sign is bad now, so I'm gonna use the interpreters, um, but uh, just, I, I just have a couple quick clarifying questions. So. Um, you said you, were, you didn't have access to interpreters in the hospital. Can you elaborate on that a little bit, please? Sometimes they didn't have interpreters there, uh, particularly for support groups. And just sometimes they would tell me the interpreters were not available or they couldn't just things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, is there um, are you is there an additional burden placed on you because of the nature of your care, the need for interpreters, etc., that wouldn't be if you were hearing? Yes, that's how I feel. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, thank you again for sharing. Uh, and uh, I, I just have to say, just as, you know, I'm trying to not be, you know, emotional like that, but it was a very emotional day, so I really appreciate everyone being there. I feel like we're sharing uh, some very important conversations today that we might not all be around for, so. Uh, I'm going to try to just keep going, and uh, thanks for everyone for being here. Um, so next up we have Maureen Conrad. Uh, 
uh, representative in your office, thank you for this listening opportunity for the community. Um, I have participated in a recovery program that is uh, a healing community. I have spent five years living and working in one. Um, that community in Massachusetts is now 102 years old. Um, because I have personally experienced the success and the benefits of th that kind of an environment, mm -hmm. I'd like to suggest to you that the, the state and particularly the county or Southeast Wisconsin investigate um, moving towards some kind of a program of that sort. I did leave you some material in the back and would be willing to speak to you um, personally on that. Um, these programs now, um, the ones that I'm aware of, are in Michigan, uh, North Carolina is a particular one I left you, and the one I worked in was in Massachusetts. Uh, we are moving in Milwaukee into um, a similar model called the Comprehensive Community Services. Mm -hmm. There are still a couple elements to that, that particular um, uh, recovery uh, that are not quite um, in place uh, from what I experienced. Um, so I'm just offering that as something to investigate. Thank you very much. And uh, can I just ask a couple of questions on that? Sure. Um, first of all, uh, what was the name of the program in Massachusetts again? Uh, the one I worked in was called Gould Farm. Uh, do you know Gould, how to spell that? G O U L D Farm. Okay. Um, it's William Gould Associates. Okay, thank you. And uh, what what was unique about the nature of these programs that were so successful, or why why it was so helpful? Uh, well, for one, it's not urban setting. The environment is rural, and so um, people have the opportunity. It's voluntary. Uh, people have the opportunity to uh, they have to commit to twenty hours of service mm -hmm. within the community. So they may be involved with some farming operations, uh, restorative uh, forestry, um, organic gardening, um, household and cooking programs, the individualized kinds of things that are designed within the program. Uh, so that's one aspect. So people, especially with dual diagnosis, are not um, exposed to temptations of recommitting or you know mm -hmm. coming back into usage and they spend approximately three months to a year in the primary in the first stage of the program and then as they go uh, community reentry it's transitional and it's 24-hour support and staff live and work within the program wonderful well thank you very much and I look forward to learning more about it um, next up we have uh, Patricia um, Brock, Brock? Uh, sorry, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right. B, or, uh, Brock, sorry. Oh. Thank you, Rep Representative, for hosting this town hall meeting. I would wish there were more representatives like you throughout the state. My name is Patricia Bronk. I used to be an employee for the state of Wisconsin at the Department of Vocational Rehab for 16 years. Now I am a graduate student uh, in social work major, and I'm currently in my internship for the Office of Public Defenders right now here in the city of Milwaukee. My testimony today is to focus on services for deaf and hard of hearing individuals with a wide, a wide variety of needs. Many of my clients are, are on Social Security, plus they have Medicare and Medicaid for their insurance purposes. They are providing some support for mental health, but it is a minimal amount. Often they charge twice as much because they feel that they have to provide interpretation for these individuals, so they're charging maybe the hospital or some other entity more money for interpreters, which makes these entities very afraid of providing services for deaf individuals because they see it as a business profit loss. 
these often, individuals are often put in jail because of their mental health needs, which can also often de deteriorate their mental health need, uh, mental health concerns further. <laughs> I'd like to see legislation add some kind of maybe uh, a tax to the physician's license once they renew, so there is a pot of money for general interpreting services in medical and mental health areas, so that the money is no longer an issue not only for deaf and hard of hearing consumers, but also for these entities that would like to provide services. And so, and that it is no longer a linguistical barrier for these patients. Please use my testimony, please use my uh, experiences. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, next up we have uh, Claudia Mayer. Represented, I really want to thank you so much for um, this opportunity to speak. I'm going to start with that I've been a clinician for 40 years. I'm an occupational therapist. And so most of my career has been either in mental health or has been with developmental disabilities. And one of the first things I want to tell you is that there are lots of levels to mental health and we need to remember all of them. And so it's children, it's veterans. Um, I will tell you the story that at Milwaukee County when I was working there, there were many, many times when a veteran was refused by the VA because they were too difficult for them to handle. And yet the patients at Milwaukee County the, the care that they received there was far superior to um, anything they would have received at the VA because there was. There was no place else for them to go. That's one of the things I need you to remember about Milwaukee County is there is no place, other place that most people will accept these patients. Mm -hmm. um, there is the adult factor. And um, just want to make sure everyone can hear. Yep, this perfect. One? Okay. Thank you. There is the adults. There is. Um, there's the geriatric patient. We have to, and there's developmental disabilities. We have to remember that there is mental health needs for all of them. When I was working at the county, we had a program that was a cutting edge, edge program. It was recognized by other states, by other counties as being cutting edge for developmental disability, where it was a team of a psychologist, an occupational therapist, a social worker, and the nursing staff and a peer specialist who worked with these, who worked on the intake. On the intake, it was that um, the person would come in, was developmentally disabled, had had a severe behavior issue in the, the city. We worked with then the provider, the family, or whoever it was to try and resolve the difficulty. In eight years' time, we went from people who were frequent flyers. I know that Dr. Justin Keel at Milwaukee County has the statistics that he could provide you about what that program looked like and the changes that were made in people's lives. That program, because Dr. Keel left his position, um, and this is within the last year, Dr. Keel left his position to take a higher position. Um, his position was not refilled and the whole program fell apart. And so the supports for all of the people, and from what I understand, the majority of people with developmental disability are now turned away at Milwaukee County's doors. They have a very, very soft spot in my heart because I have not yet met a developmentally dis disabled person who is dumb. They are the smartest individuals on the face of this earth, and very often it's their lack of ability to communicate with us that allows us to know what to do and how to help them. It's not only an issue in terms of mental health, it's, a term, it's an issue in terms of any kind of community services. What you will hear in particular with developmental disability is that people don't want to deal with them. When I first got to Milwaukee County, the reason this program came into existence is that people with developmental disability were in the mainstream of the population within the units. The patients took better care, care of the the individuals with de developmental disability than did the staff. And so it was created that there was something better for them and many, many of them got far better and became stabilized in their community placements. I believe with mental health that's exactly what we want. 
We want people to become stable in their lives. The other thing I would talk about is that trauma is huge in the lives and in the individuals who have any kind of mental illness. Trauma, trauma is pervasive. All of us have had some type of trauma. Trauma ends up being people make poor choices in order to cope with the traumas that they've had. There's a program, and I know it's focused on children, but I believe you should look at it. Dr. Bruce Perry um, is at the sure Child Institute in Texas. And his programming focuses on the development of the brain um, in terms of trauma. I believe if his program became mainstream, I'm now working at St. A's um, in foster treatment foster care, in child welfare, and in residential. Mm -hmm. And we're, we exclusively use his theoretical framework in order to deal more humanely with the children and the populations that we serve. Mm -hmm. um, as we are applying this theory, it becomes very evident that people are trying to self-regulate by their behaviors, whether it's drugs and alcohol, whether it's a behavioral kind of component, but that's what we need to now focus on is this whole idea of trauma. One other piece, mm -hmm. occupational therapy, I know recently came up as a um, potential piece of legislation to be changed into a different regulated kind of board. I also would speak against that in terms of this mental health thing because mm -hmm. you need a profession to be policed by its own profession. Thank you very much. Uh, and yeah, the, DS, the, the legislation dealing with that uh, Actually, th there's a lot of issues, and also um, with the deaf and hard of hearing uh, components that would have been changed. So I was able to uh, talk with the author, and it looks like it's not going to go through. That was a department ask, and he said, you know, quite frankly, he said, you know, I, I don't even really care that much about this. It's just something we're trying to do a favor to the department, and he didn't really, I think, realize all that he was getting into with it. So um, yeah, so it looks like it's not going to come through. So good, yeah. good news on that. And then. I, I had a quick clarifying question. I didn't catch the last name of the of the doctor, Dr. Bruce. Bruce Perry, P-E-R-R-Y. Okay, and if you could, uh, if it's possible to get my office any of that information uh, that he's been working on, any of that uh, data, that'd be really helpful. Absolutely. The only other thing I would say is we need to also look in terms of children and violence and school systems, and school systems not handing out the um, disciplinary actions. You know, one of the things in mental health is that everything becomes disciplinary. If you fix your behavior, then maybe you'll get better. And you know, when you're better, then we'll work with you, kind of thing. No. And the same thing goes for kids. Kids who are having difficulty in school, we need to look at their trauma. What's the trauma in their life? We need to look at self-regulation strategies. It would be better to be looking at what kind of supportive programs can we put in schools to keep kids in school but help them with their behavior. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and uh, I also <laughs> forgot to mention at the beginning, um, my, uh, if, if anyone does not want to talk publicly, but wants to get in touch with me or set up a coffee or something like that, uh, feel free to hit me up. And my um, email address is just uh, rep.brostoff, so it's um, rep.brostoff. -F at uh, legis.wi.gov and our, all our books and our cards and everything on the side has that. Um, yeah, and, uh, you know, so you can just pick up our cards uh, or you can just call me directly, but um, yeah, so that and uh, I also hope that this isn't the last conversation. It looks like there's a lot of interest today and I'd like to have more of these, so you know, I, I want to just let people know this isn't going to be the last opportunity to have a form of this nature, I think, uh, warrants more kind of community conversations. Um, so. Next, we have uh, Dwayne Block. Um, well, I'm glad to be here and I'm glad to be having this uh, support program. Um, I've been involved with the uh, mental health program for about 30 years. I was separated from my wife for a couple of years and uh, needed some help. Found a program called Recovery, in, uh, uh, Recovery International. It was started by Abraham Lowe in the 30s uh, uh, in Chicago. Uh, it's a similar, I, I would think, uh, maybe to Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a volunteer program, and um, 
In the 30s, I think the situation was different than it is today, or and there was, you know, not that much help, I don't think. There weren't that many counselors, I don't think, in the 30s. Uh, yet we had severe difficulties with uh, poverty and so forth. Mm. Um, so this um, program started to be built in the 30s, and it's a very structured, disciplined program. It's a brilliant program, I think. I mean, it could, if everybody in the country could study the concepts and the, and the training devices in this program, it would, it would be amazing. Um, so uh, I'm not sure if there's a place, in, you know, in, in this situation in Milwaukee here with the reduction of funds, but um, um, possibly uh, the best experts are in Chicago at the headquarters, uh, people could be brought in to, uh, to, uh, this, to develop volunteers to, uh, and it would be uh, mainly for, I mean, the, the really tough mental case problems would uh, maybe not uh, benefit as much as, uh, as the lesser problems. Uh, but you have, you have to be able to train the mind. Um, but it, it's a thought. Uh, Maybe there's a place for it. It would be great. I mean, there are, there were hundreds of programs across the country, uh, hundreds of meetings across the country over the years. But uh, it's been going down in effectiveness as you have more and more counselors uh, going to the field. And uh, maybe in the last few years, uh, uh, people uh, that uh, that would work are working too many hours, or they just don't have as much. Uh, available time to go to an evening meeting or something, I, I'm not sure, but it'd be great to, to build this program up again. It has so much potential for help. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dwayne. And uh, next we'll have uh, Mary Newbar. Thank you, Representative Orstaff. I'm just here to mention that I'm a member of the Milwaukee County Mental Health Board and actually in the league right now, and my colleagues, a uh, few of them weren't able to be here today. And I really encourage you to come out to the Mental Health Board meetings. The board needs to hear what's going on in the community. Um, the times that the meetings are held is not necessarily conducive to the public. Um, we end up with full agendas. There's scrutiny because uh, how much time the agenda takes, and uh, I, I fully have heard that message. And just to let you know, you can go on to the website for the Milwaukee County Mental Health Board. Um, the next meeting is February 25th at 8 a.m. at the Zufari Building. Um, that is not public comment, but the meeting following that on March 24th um, at 4.30 p.m. is a public comment because we're starting on the budget process. And uh, there is also the Joint Task Force on the Local Public-Private Partnership and the National Entity Partnership and you have to go to the website, nothing's listed right now, and uh, though that is a task force that is looking at whether the hospital will become a private public entity in Milwaukee County or become part of a, a national entity. So there's really been no public that has come to those meetings. I'm not in there uh, because someone is, is representing me at this time, but I felt it important enough to be here today to really encourage people to come to those meetings um, because uh, and my understanding is there's going to be a community conversation and not a two-minute come up here and tell us why you want this in two minutes. So please uh, go to the Milwaukee County Mental Health Board website, look at what's going on there, and uh, please stay informed. We've asked for meetings to be put out there publicly and uh, have not gotten the kind of uh, response that we would hope to get. So thank Th you. Thank you. And I uh, can just elaborate. You said that. The upcoming meeting on February Right, it's is, a regular board meeting. So, um, so at the regular board meetings, there's not room for public comments? No, there aren't. There's only certain meetings where public comment is assigned. Um, we really worked hard, a number of us, to have additional public comment meetings added mm -hmm. to the current meeting schedule for 2016. And with the budget, I think there's going to be a proposal of adding another one. If, if the public wants to have input into that process. And as I understand it, when Act 203 went into place, the idea was to garner more public input and to get more expertise from the community. Um, so towards that end, towards the spirit of that act, if the public 
uh, wants to participate in that way, what are some opportunities for them to do so? Right now, the only thing is to send a uh, written comment to talk to board members individually. But the problem is, if you look at the website, there's no contact information for the board members. So, you know, I stand up here as frustrated as, as the public is and uh, just encourage, as of right now, the uh, way the situation was uh, put forth is that you could contact an administrator of the Behavioral Health Division who is the front door to comments coming in from the Mental Health Board. Whether that's going to change or not, I have absolutely no idea, but that's currently the uh, process that's in place. Okay, well, thank you very much, and I think it's an important point. Uh, and, you know, part of what we're here today to discuss is the update, because, you know, it's been about a year since Act 203 uh, has taken effect, and, you know, now with the transition with the state takeover, uh, we want to know exactly what's happening in the county, but it sounds like, you know, we need more opportunity for public input. So I know Mary is one of the leading experts uh, in not just Milwaukee, but in Wisconsin, and I've heard her testimony on Madison as well as in the community. So I would, if, if it's okay with you, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but encourage people to, first of all, introduce themselves. We haven't met Mary before, but second of all, um, you know, see how to get involved. And, uh, you know, again, we're lucky enough to be graced with the presence of such an expert here. So um, take advantage of it. Oh, I guess the other thing that we can, I can say is we have three new board members coming in. There's a new board member, and unfortunately, I don't know the gentleman's name that will replace Lynn Milosky as a person with lived experience. Hmm. Um, I believe I heard that Christine Apple, Dr. Apple from the Department of Corrections, will be coming in uh, in one of the board slots. I don't know if it's in the substance use slot, and then the mental health provider because. Uh, uh, Pete Carlson, who was the CEO and president of Aurora Psychiatric Services and Psychiatric Services for, for Aurora, actually resigned about a week after I went on a leave of absence. Um, and also the leadership as far as the chair and vice chair, those things, those folks will be voted in, in the February meeting. And as you know yourself, that really can affect uh, the opportunity to a board to function as to who's running the meeting. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, next, uh, Kathy Schmidt. of access and limitation of 
other individuals that had expertise in death and hard to children, people with mental illness. I have worked with clients who are being mandated into a hospital because the often the, if they are arrested, there is lack of communication, lack of access not only in the hospital but with law enforcement. These are often cases that could be served in the community, but resources are not allocated appropriately in that way. I've seen in my personal and professional experiences serious problems in Milwaukee County and statewide. There were two individuals that did represent our community that couldn't attend today, Eve Digger Eisman. Uh, I know she gave you, I have a letter that I will uh, forward to you. She is the chair of the Mental Health Committee for Wisconsin Association for the Deaf. She has done her research, research not only statewide, but nationwide as far as what would best serve in the deaf and hard care mm -hmm. community. She's encouraging for a mental health coordinator within the state to help coordinate appropriately cultural and linguistic services in the state. So we definitely want that. The second individual that could not join us today is Tom Benzinger. He is actually from the state of Illinois and has worked as an advocate in the deaf and hard care community for over 50 years. He has recently located to the state of Wisconsin and he has stated that the services in the state of Illinois were quite different and ahead of the state of Wisconsin. And he felt like this going, moving to the state was moving back in time as far as mental health services. That the services that are provided for the community are greatly lacking, not only in communication access, but in interpreting issues as our fellow deaf individual mentioned before, treatment, lack of interpreting services, getting appointments when necessary is a serious issue for people who are struggling. Also, we have noticed that if deaf individuals would like to get communication access, they often have to travel great distances. We see this greatly in our northern areas. They often have to travel to more urban environments to get appropriate services. Thank you for listening today. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I, um, first of all, appreciate the perspective and I feel like it's something, it's a, a voice in this conversation that, uh, you know, in Madison we don't hear enough of. Um, so I just have a couple quick questions. There was talk that, you know, Eve um, mentioned and you reiterated a mental health coordinator in Wisconsin um, at, the, at the state level. Um, could you elaborate that, uh, on that a little bit and what it would do for us? And uh, one other question I had was you were, you know, you mentioned that most of the professionals, you know, occupy fields in, you know, in education, although, you know, it's unique in your situation as a social worker. Um, I was wondering if you could just go into that a little bit more and talk about why it's so important to have uh, more professions outside of, uh, you know, education, but also um, what your experience is like and, and why it's been so tough and also, you know, as a more technical question, how you got your clinical hours in.
If you ask our, our deaf professionals, it is easier to get their hours or their licensure through a Department of Public Education in instruction. It's an easier access. Um, there's more uh, language hours. When you start working out in the community, the clinical requirements set up a lot of communication barriers. I am more than willing and I'm currently going through those hours and it has been an incredibly long process for me, which I am working through. And it's very frustration, frustrating because I see clients that have already experienced other services in other areas with misdiagnosis because the individual who did the original assessment didn't know about people who are deaf or hard of hearing or American Sign Language. They may have thought the client had a mental illness just simply because they were using sign language and to them, the person who has never experienced a deaf person assumes that it is aggression. Rather than knowing the grammatical structure or how things are expressed in ASL, they immediately assume somebody is being aggressive by using sign language. So having a clinician that is culturally and linguistically aware allows for really appropriate diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Also, it does create a comfort. When you can communicate directly with your clinician, that connection that is so critical in mental health happens easier. Thank you very much. And uh, next we have uh, Michael Heinberg. Heinberg. Thank you, Representative. I'm here t today to ask for a continuation of. Yeah, sorry, we, we need all three mics, sorry, if possible. <laughs> it's kind of, yeah, talk about coordination. There you go. <laughs> I'm asking that you please continue funding of comprehensive community services and peer specialists. Both those programs are very, very valuable in the community because they avert expensive hospitalization and really provide beneficial services to people with mental health disability. And then today I heard often um, the lack of interpretive services for people who are deaf. Um, and I just want to mention too that it's, it's against the law not to provide that under the American Disability Act. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, next we have uh, Terry Els Elzing. Hello, everyone. Um, first, I just kind of want to thank everybody so far for some of the things that they've stated because um, what we sometimes don't realize in the mental health uh, profession is when we talk about the uh, scheme of cultural competence, we do not always think about um, the deaf and hard of hearing. So I really thank those ladies who came up today to speak on that. Um, I come before you as someone who has um, lived experience, uh, relatives who are mentally ill. I'm also a mental health professional. I sit on a number of committees who are planners um, in services throughout the city of Milwaukee. And, um, and I'm an African American or a black person. And that's a big deal to me um, as I speak today. So um, Thursday, they had a really good forum held at UWM yep. um, for uh, mental health in the African American community and how significant um, it is that 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 per, that group of people alone have a lot of mental health experiences as well as trauma. Okay, um, some of the areas that I just wanted to address today. Um, was um, one would be the lack of professional representation in our community. Um, in the time, in the years that I was getting my master's degree, I have two master's degrees, but the last one is in mental health counseling. And in the effort of getting my uh, master's degree, um, one of the challenges and barriers that a lot of um, black women like myself, not only being non-traditional students, meaning having to work a full-time job, take care of a child, and be married, and then have to still do the hours that you need to do for internship. So a lot of times, my husband's here, he can tell you, I would probably be gone anywhere from 60 to 80 hours per week, okay? Um, and then also the, the challenges of getting placements because a lot of places in our community um, do not offer or hire um, African Americans um, in those type of uh, clinic, clinical settings. 
Um, one of the things that I do want to address too, um, after listening to some of the other people, is that usually when the state offers money, they have to divide up the, uh, the need. So they have a pendulum that they want to swing where it's either, okay, so we have a hearing impaired population that really needs to be addressed, we have an African American population, we have an Hispanic population, or whatever, whatever that is the catchphrase of that year. Mm -hmm. So the money usually goes to that, that particular person. And so uh, although we study, learn, and we say the word cultural competency, how much of that is really coming into practice? Mm -hmm. um, so to get kind of into the black community, which uh, we talked about a little bit on Thursday, is um, not only are blacks a large number of persons who are systemically serviced by the mental health system, but they're also not serviced to their fullest capacity. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so a lot of cultural barriers may be ignored because a lot of clinicians who are primarily white, 25 to 30 year old women, do not understand maybe something that a 50 year old woman or male is going through. So it becomes very important that sometimes that representation is needed. Mm -hmm. Also, um, being somebody who sits on a committee um, who is planning for like a grant that's coming to the city, um, again, I'm the only African-American woman or there's one or two people in that meeting that's representative of the greater number of people who are being serviced. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about a pilot program where 65% of those individuals are African-American, you only have one or two African-Americans who are planning in the process of what services are needed to help those utilization systems. Mm -hmm. um, I will also um, want to kind of um, briefly kind of just go into, because I have a list of things here, um, is the other issue with minorities and clinical services is that because majority of those individuals who are of color or with other disabilities, a lot of clinicians do not take forward health or state insurances, which limits the availability of services for those individuals. So I may see a client and they say, well, my psychiatric appointment may not be for a month. If I miss my med refill, I may not be able to get my, see my doctor in a month. And then keep in mind that a lot of these psychiatrists who provide services to low and no income individuals, caseloads are ridiculously too large for them to be effective, efficient service providers. Um, so, and I close with this, because I have a lot to say, but I'm only gonna say so much. Um, as a clinician myself, or a practicing learning clinician myself, a lot of the evidence-based practices that are being used in some of these clinics are not also culturally sensitive or relevant. So I would close with that so that if in the, in the future, if we are looking at what Milwaukee should look like going forward with mental health is to, when, when, when that strategic planning takes place, diversify your team. Thank you. Thank you and <laughs> ma'am, uh, can I just, um, I'd like to also ask, uh, I, I appreciate you uh, coming up and testifying, but um, moving forward with mental health care, especially in Milwaukee, is a conversation I want to be a part of. So I'd ask if it's possible uh, just to check in with uh, my staff at the door and we can you know, do like a one-on-one -on -one coffee and talk about what that would look like in the future. If, if you have time for it, I'd love that, so. It, it, not today, but uh, yeah, we can, yeah, we can figure out something. Thank you. And next we have uh, Amy Turum. Oh, sorry. Hey. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and I wanted to thank everybody here who's a mental health professional. Um, Thanks. I've worked with many mental health professionals over the years in my positions in housing. I'm here on my own today not to represent the views of my employer. Just toss that in there. Um, <laughs> I'm trained in mental health first aid response. I took a class that took eight hours and it taught me how to deal with individuals who are experiencing mental health crisis. It wasn't a huge time commitment, and it really wasn't very expensive for the person who put on the class to put on. Mm -hmm. That type of training would be extremely effective in our schools when people are first entering the mental health care system so that they are not labeled as behavioral issues and are labeled instead, or 
treated instead as persons who have problems. I also have training in trauma-informed care, which, as someone mentioned, St. A's is working a lot on. Knowing the signs of trauma, and especially as Terry mentioned, the signs of trauma in our African-American community mm -hmm. is what's going to take mental health care forward. But what's also going to take mental health care forward is highly trained social workers. Many of the individuals in this room are working with people with mental health, and they're very dedicated to be here on a Saturday, and they're doing an excellent job. But we also have underfunded agencies that are putting forth people to do very important jobs with little training and little pay and little benefits. And if you take a workforce that's so essential to the public safety and you pay them close to minimum wage and you don't reimburse them for their school expenses, they're going to leave. And they do. In droves. I had one agency that I've worked with in the past that was responsible for doling out medication on a daily basis to people in their homes. They were assigned by the Department of Corrections to help people who were re-entering. I walked into one of their participants' homes one time, and I slipped and I fell. And what I slipped and I fell upon was thousands of pills. It was abundantly clear to me that that person had been going to the door, dropping off the medication, and never set foot inside that man's apartment. And that man had behavior problems because he wasn't taking his meds. And that man became homeless. We can do a heck of a lot better than that. And we can do a heck of a lot better for people who are too, have too high of an income to receive services under Title 19. There's a whole population of people who are underserviced because they don't qualify for public benefits. I went to Walgreens the other day. And I went to Walgreens because I had to get Prozac for my dog. Now, I have insurance, but my dog doesn't have insurance. So I had to get this Prozac for my dog. And I'm not making light of mental health. But they told me it was going to be $160 for one month's worth of Prozac on a normal amount of drugs. And I said, I can't pay for that. Are there any programs available to me? There weren't because I was low income. So I called a different veteran, or not low income, I called a veterinarian. They gave me the same drugs for $16. It's easier for me to get Prozac for my dog than it is for an uninsured person. That's terrible. I'd also like to mention that there's not enough resources being devoted to hoarding. Hoarding is an issue in our society that not a lot of people know how to deal with. And when sometimes when I'd come across these situations, the Department on Aging would be called because most of these individuals are older. They're people who've lived through the Depression. They're people who've seen their parents scrimp and save. And they're living amongst things that are unsafe and in unsafe environments. It's nearly impossible to get a response on that issue, and we need increased training there as well. Thank you for listening today, and thank you for all the social workers who gave up their Saturday to come in today. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. And uh, next we have uh, Lorraine Skronsky. Ms. Skronsky. to say affects many of my co-workers at BHD. Um, as a side, I know this person and I uh, was in the uh, deaf community for quite some time, so uh, um, I'm aware of the cultural differences and I a lot of times will address them with my um, colleagues. The misperception that I encounter is that because deaf people can write English, of course they can understand what you write. But ASL is not written in a English structure. Right. So what the person might be writing, or right. me as a staff member is writing, might not be interpreted by the deaf client appropriately without the use of an interpreter. So that was an aside. Um, I came here because I worked at Hilltop, which was a residential treatment program for close to two, year, two years. And you can just, yeah, perfect, thanks. Um, I worked at Hilltop, which was a residential treatment for close to two years. 
Uh, the clients there had mental illness and a lot of them were violent. Uh, with behavior treatment plans developed by a psychologist and medication administration <coughs> overseen by a psychiatrist, clients went from dealing with their feelings by acting out in a violent manner to being less violent. Mm. Some of these clients were ready to be transitioned to a group home upon discharge, others less so. And by discharge, I mean when they closed Hilltop. The success stories you read about in the paper were of those who were ready to return to the community. And my concern is why, has not, why hasn't there been enough follow-up on each client that was discharged? Because some of them weren't ready. Other clients treated on Hilltop had severe developmental delay and cannot care for themselves, nor can they express themselves. A lot of these have corporate guardians who never came to see these clients. I heard through uh, people talking at, at work that one of these clients were checked on by DHD staff, was found covered in feces and locked in a room. Of course, they were taken out of that setting but are there others out there mm -hmm. in a similar predicament that we don't know about? Um, at BHD, there were many people watching over the clients and watching each other to ensure these clients were not being abused. When, when there was an injury, there's paperwork, protocol we had to follow. We had to call the guardian. Sometimes the parents weren't the guardian, and due to HIPAA, we couldn't release that information. But somebody was contacted contacted, a doctor was notified, supervisor was notified, doctor was contacted, nurse practitioners were uh, consulted to see them if the injury is minor, but we still wanted to follow up. Ma'am, uh, I don't I mean to interrupt, we're getting a couple of complaints that we can't hear the microphone uh, too long, I apologize for it's kind of a weird logistical thing today. Yeah, so, yeah, and just, if we can, I, I know it's not a great situation, sorry about that. Um, maybe actually, we can use the handheld one Let's do that. Yeah, do you want to handle this one? Yeah. Yeah. I think that might be easier. Just want to make sure everyone can hear appropriately, so we're going to just use the handheld mic uh, for now until we can figure something else out. <laughs> prior to the, prior to oh, it's in. Okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, prior to Can you do me a favor and uh, just go check and see if there's any tissues that we can get? Thanks. And if there are, you can grab us up. Just to close the program, just just to close it, you didn't look at it, improving it. 
interesting one that the code of ethics that we spoke about, I also cited, and I don't want to want to speak out against management policies. I'm concerned about retaliation. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh. Yeah. Can we adjust the levels? The feedback's coming in, please. Rebecca, can we just adjust the levels? Thanks. Thank you. And um, actually, we're just going up to get some tissues, which might be helpful. But thanks, Jeanette. I guess we have them on hand if we need them. So. Um, Next, we have up, uh, and sorry, does it sound like you what it sounds like to me? Okay, I'm gonna try to hold this lower so we're not, uh, so we're not getting that. Um, next, we have uh, Peggy Hart. Thanks. Is uh, Peggy still here? Sorry, in the back before. Oh, she left. Okay. Um, next we, ha sorry. Next we have Diana. Next we have uh, Diana Dentino. Yeah, we gotta get these mics fixed. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for hosting the town hall meeting. My name is Diana Dentino, and I um, was trained as a teacher for the deaf and an American Sign Language interpreter for the deaf. I am here, clearly not as a mental health professional, but as a concerned citizen who has worked in the deaf community in an educational settings for the past 25 years. I want to begin by sharing some interesting and perhaps startling statistics with you, and then connect them with the need for our local community to provide accessible and skilled mental health services um, that have um, experience and knowledge working with individuals who are deaf. About 90% of deaf population have two hearing parents. And 88% of those parents do not know sign language. Now, I got that statistic from a website online, www.defed.net, just for your reference. I don't intend to expound on um, that here. There are a variety of reasons why parents don't learn sign language, but I want to share those statistics with you to make a point. <coughs> In working with the deaf community for the past two decades, the common theme they've shared with me are the feelings of loneliness and isolation. Broadly speaking, I would share um, that this seems to be a collective experience for many people who are deaf. And that statistic cited earlier might give you a glimpse of why that might be so. We know that statistics say that children that grow up in an abusive, neglected, or traumatic environment, uh, we know what they say about it, and oftentimes um, with mental health intervention, they can go on to um, become productive citizens. Mm -hmm. Today I work with young deaf adults transitioning from high school to the post-secondary environment. Some of the students I work with are functionally illiterate, yet they do have a high school diploma. How that happens, I don't know. But in any event, I work with these individuals. I see them struggle, I see some succeed, and I see some fail. Individuals that succeed move on with their lives. It's the individuals that struggle and those that fail in the academic setting that bring me here today to voice concern for the mental health and well-being of these individuals. Struggle and failure bring on all sorts of issues that require the ability to problem solve, do self-advocacy, make decisions, take action, and all those good things. Typically, school systems have support for at-risk students. However, it's an exception that a school setting would have a mental health professional on staff 
with expertise in working with deaf individuals. Students who are deaf are often treated as disabled in these environments rather than the linguistic and cultural minority that they are. In conclusion, it is imperative that these individuals who are deaf have access to skilled mental health professionals that have knowledge and expertise in working with the deaf in Milwaukee. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, uh, next up we have Eugene Brufkin. Thank you for being here. I wish we would have more sessions like this, not only for mental health, but for every issue we have in this state. We, we just need more open hearings so the citizens come out and talk. I don't think you're looking for the volume of any one particular problem that people are talking about today. All the problems are out there, so I want to address one that I hadn't heard being approached yet. And that is whether a person is incarcerated without a mental health problem, or with a mental health problem, or is in a uh, inpatient situation for mental health treatment, they need to be as close to their families as possible. And I always look for something good to come out of whatever bad there is. The Lincoln Hills situation is just that. You have and we now know how many kids were up there from Milwaukee County. They're coming back. But their families, in many cases, couldn't visit them. Right. That was one of the big problems right there. So we, I hope we're going to have like a big 150-page comprehensive report out of this, not just taking one piece at a time, because everything seems to be related. And, and that is one pervasive uh, issue that I've heard in other states too. I've heard all over the country. You can't send these people away far from their neighborhoods. They need their neighborhood support. Sometimes it's not even a, a part of the biological family. Sometimes it, they, they've been living with friends. Sometimes, whatever it is, uh, they need that um, support. So uh, please look at that. And the other problem definitely is, that I've worked on for many, many years, these clients that the uh, social workers are talking about, they usually don't vote. So what happens is the politicians aren't listening because they're not getting the vote. And, that, and it's the vote that's most important. We have to solve that problem. These people need to be registered also. We need to be educated in how important it is for them to vote. And thank you again. This is great. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, to that point, just as a friendly reminder, I know we had some new faces since I last announced it. We do have two wonderful volunteers in the back, uh, you know, working on just that. We obviously do have an election coming up and then one soon after. So uh, uh, really thank them for being here today and uh, thank you for the comments. Um, and please feel free to uh, uh, chat with them um, for that point. Next we have uh, Martha Pincus.
we just we, we, we didn't know what to do where to go. We, we are a medi medicine based family. Um, my husband's a doctor, I'm a nurse. Um, and we tried our hardest to try to find some place for him to be helped. Um, there was, we finally, finally got him some help out of Aurora. Um, but it was because that we really pushed, pushed, pushed for the fact that this kid needed to live and he needed to live long enough to be able to understand his own issues. Um, I guess where I'm coming from is that we were able to eventually send him to wilderness um, program and out of state programs and we spent something like $175,000 for this type of care. Um, he's doing much, much better. He did walk away, but he is really doing quite, quite well. Um, he's back in town. He's paying his bills. He's finding out why I um, work with groups that want 15 in the union because he says he can't, he can't make it. You know, he's having trouble buying food, and his transportation is uh, buses. But uh, one thing that you know he has talked about, and my husband and myself has talked about, is what the heck happens to people that don't ha happen to have the money to be able to send their kid out of state, that are able, you know, to, you know, try to, try, you know, find places after much, much research, um, and you know, how do how do people do this? And so I guess what I'm saying is that. We couldn't find, we could not find help here. Uh, we eventually found help, you know, other places, but it took a whole, whole lot of effort. We had to hire a person that um, we were interviewed for. We interviewed him, he interviewed us, he interviewed my son, and we found the places that seemed to be most suited for him. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, with Mark, you know, my son being on, you know, ADD meds at the time, there was many, and this is, you know, I don't know how many people know, but if you're on ADD meds, uh, most places won't take you. Um, so we had an even that, even though we found places that eventually worked, um, they were not the places that we wanted him to go to, at, you know, at the beginning. He's not on all meds. Um, we do see that he's, like I said, he's doing a lot better. Um, he understands that it's going to be a lifelong problem. But I just don't know what people do. I honest to God don't know what people do. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, next we have Mary Devitt. Oh, perfect. Okay, perfect. Uh, next we have uh, Candace Alley. County Board can no longer have any say over our mental health system and therefore they won't uh, they feel they can't hold hearings because it would leave a false impression that they had some say and so it, it is very frustrating to not know how to bring forth concerns anymore and as you hear and it's much more important for you to hear from the people who are working uh, directly uh, in the mental health delivery system but that the idea of having a, a public board that gets taxpayer dollars that doesn't hold, take public testimony and is very restricted on the times that they even meet has to be, it just has to be looked into because I don't think that was what was 
well, I'm sure some people maybe thought that was the intent of the law, but that, that really was not what we understood the intent of the law to be, that it was going to be a quasi-public uh, operation. And then, as you've heard briefly, we're deeply concerned about the fact that the employees have now been uh, made to sign a form that they're not allowed to, to uh, say anything about uh, the, the administrative practices uh, at the mental health center. And um, I just have to believe it's, it's much more difficult because we don't have union contracts anymore where we would be able to challenge that or, or if they took action, um, you know, at least help the employees with that situation. But there's no question, no question that it'll have a chilling effect on any of the workers being willing to state in any public uh, arena uh, any of the concerns they might have. And if you say that they can't go to the mental health board uh, because they don't hear uh, things, and if they're not, they can't go to the county board, and if they are afraid to come forward, then it really, it really limits your ability to, and the other people who care about this, their ability to know uh, what is happening. So I don't know if there are ways to challenge that, but I would also point out so that, that uh, you know that there is a state whistleblower protection law, and if uh, any uh, healthcare people, nurses, speak up in a public, before a legislative body, they have, should have whistleblower protection. I'm not sure of the enforceability under the, this administration, but uh, it is a law that was passed, and, and in case you get any feedback or that we communicate to you that anybody had retaliation, there is another vehicle there, and, and we're also going to look into to any way to challenge that, uh, as, you, as you mentioned earlier, whether the legality of, of gag orders uh, of this nature. So again, thank you for holding these hearings. Thank you very much, and um, I'm, I'm not a lawyer by training, and I, I don't, uh, you know, the, the representative from this area, Evan Goyke, is, so to double back with him on a lot of, you know, the legal questions I have, but uh, if possible, I'd like to get the, if, if it's possible to get the language that you're referring to specifically, because, again, I still, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but I don't understand how you can, as a private citizen, express your opinion in this country, and how your job can prevent you from doing that, so... I would like to see exactly what that looks like and look into if that's possible. And um, I also would like to, uh, I'll, you know, we can look more into that. But yeah, I mean, I think that's the point is we want to be able to have those open public conversations, you know, because that's the nature of the work we're doing. This is a uh, public health issue. So yeah, again, thank you very much. I'd love to get that language if that's thank possible. You very much. Thank you. Next, we have uh, former uh, state representative uh, Sandy Pash, and uh, my mentor and good friend. Thank you, Representative. I want to thank everyone for being here. Um, obviously, there are things that need to be said regarding mental health services, both in our state, but especially in Milwaukee County. And I would like to ask you to gather some other representatives some changes in the mental health board um, legislation that was passed a few years ago. I was part of creating that legislation, so I'd like to take people down memory lane a little bit. The bill came forward, um, I believe it was January, two years ago, and the session was about to end, and usually a good bill takes some time to be developed and worked through, so the best ideas from a lot of different contributors can be put forward to make the best legislation. Um, it was rushed, but it did have some changes. The original draft very seriously limited who could be on the board, and it was pretty much people in administrative positions. It was limited to seven. Um, looking at who would qualify for that, we were very clear, myself and other members of the community and other legislators, that it would exclude people of color, it would exclude people with lived position, um, lived experiences with mental illness, it would exclude family members. Um, there were a lot of voices that would not be heard of on this panel of experts. So we were able to make some changes to increase the representation of who would be on that board. But still there was discussion as it went forward that this was being rushed and that it was a flawed piece of legislation that would need to be revisited. I was assured by the main author of the bill that 
that would indeed happen. This is the most important now, testimony. We definitely have this one. And Mary Gavar, thank you for being here, Mary, who members of the board who have tried very, very hard to make sure that there were more, to, to try to make, to try to obtain more public hearings were shut down because it says minimally there will be one hearing, not the most you can have is one, and that there's the opportunity for the board to open it up. Um, sadly, if we need legislation to do that, I would encourage you to put that forward. Um, secondly, the opportunity for really open discussion and um, by members of the board is, is really not as respected as, as it should be. For example, the board put forth an amendment to increase funding in the budget to have two fully funded crisis resource centers in Milwaukee. Now, why is this important? Because municipalities across Milwaukee County are training police on CIT, crisis intervention team training, um, so they are good responders to people in a mental health crisis. But a key part of making that a successful program is having a crisis resource center, an alternative to jails and emergency rooms for officers to take people who don't need the level of acuity that would require um, an emergency room. It was only $350,000, give or take a few, and that went to the county exec who whittled it down by $250,000. So we still don't have 24-7 um, availability at the crisis resource centers for individuals who need a place to go, who need some respite and, and some support, but don't require the, the um, level of care that would be in an, uh, an emergency room. Uh, we are hearing that numbers of individuals with mental illness is increasing in the jails. That's not supposed to happen. Um, it, it's been an issue that we've known about for a very long time, and this board was supposed to be empowered to address that, and here they did something to help address that, and, and it was taken out. There's really no recourse that the board has to override any vetoes or partial alterations or whatever that can be done by the county exec. So the, um, the voice of the people really is not being listened to. So I really would encourage the legislature to take a look at that and see what changes can be done because it was a piece of legislation that was rushed through and when it was being rushed through, there was the understanding that it would need to be revisited and it definitely needs to be revisited. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, next up, we have Kelly uh, Narek. Narek. Thanks. Hi. Thank you for um, having this meeting today. Um, I'm here to say, as a representative of my union, and what I have to say affects everyone who works at the hospital, the mental health complex. As a nurse that works at the, in the Psychiatric Crisis Services Department, which is the Mental Health Complex's emergency room, I am concerned about the lack of support and resources that are in the community at this time. Although I've only worked there for two years, I have seen um, a cycling of the mentally ill in and out of VHD um, coming back to the complex in a worse state than when they left to go live in private facilities. It seems that there is a lack of appropriate oversight and regulation within these group homes. These group home facilities don't appear to be able to give the, to give the care that we at VHD are able to provide. The newspapers seem to fail to report about this. My coworkers and I are not bad guys wanting to lock people up. There is so much more I would like to say, but as some of my other union representatives have stated, I've signed the Code of Ethics and I don't want to speak out against management policies. However, I would like to say that at the complex, we are professionals doing the best we can with the least resources that we have. We truly care about the people we serve. We, as mental health professionals, need more resources to make sure that we can continue to care for these vulnerable members of society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I just want to follow up, uh, if I know you might be prohibited from saying certain things, but if you could just give a little bit of insight, maybe give like an anecdotal example about um, someone who you worked with that had an experience in the group home that came back, and if you could just kind of tell what that sounds like. Uh, sure. Okay, so a long time ago, I knew a girl that worked in a group home facility, and from what I remember, she told me she didn't really have much training to go work in these facilities, 
Mm -hmm. And uh, she told me that she experienced a whole lot of um, behaviors that she was not prepared to um, approach. She didn't have the proper resources to really um, keep herself safe or keep the patient safe. Thank you. And uh, next up, we have uh, Paul Zazadny. Hello, uh, hello, Jonathan. Hey. Um, uh, representative, I come here uh, Paul Zazadny as a individual and as a full recovery um, person um, in the mental health disability community. Um, I'm at a state of pure. Of Full cured and pure, uh, and rehabilitated throughout these years. I'm just going to tell a brief thing about my past. Um, in 1991, I committed a arson uh, here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. For that, I um, I was uh, sentenced to Mendota Mental Health Institution for um, over six over six years. I was there. Uh, in 1991. Uh, in September, they found out I had something called a brain tumor, a ganglioma brain tumor in my head, and that was the cause of my situation. And throughout that time being at Mendota Mental Health, I was going through lots of um, treatment and care. Then after that, I went to uh, group, group homes, then I came back to Milwaukee, uh, Wisconsin after 1999. In 2004, I got released from the uh, uh, Department of Corrections and, and the system uh, related to the, the, the arson. And after that, I still had rehabilitation. I, I became an independent individual. I've been working very hard to keep my, I helped the community in many things I did. Was in the newspaper one for Easter baskets I gave to the community. Uh, right now I am flower power and you know, I do my herbs to help, help alternatives for um, addiction. So I've been doing that. Uh, one of my concerns is there are individuals like that, certain individuals in the system that the way the state interpretates things, interpretate things. I was in the case, I'm not going to be detailed, where they interpretate using past against you. There was a part that said, based on the motion, defendant found not guilty of mental disease and defect from 1991. They used past cases interpreting. Again, I had a brain tumor interpreting. Now the situation is this could still follow these days where when a cop pulls a person with a disability over and then by, uh, um, then looks up in the records under CCAP, which will not have details, they will interpret that person is mentally ill at that present time. And, there. and it can also relate to the district attorneys using a past case doing with mental illness on those things. Why am I bringing this up is some certain individuals like myself and others, they're fully rehabilitated and stuff. I believe there should be executive order from your, um, from your thing of cleansing the files is to dis do a um, committee of talking about certain files from Health and Human Services, Department of Corrections, even CCAT be destroyed. Why? It's because why would you want something on your back for the rest of your life that they're going to interpret in, in future situations? And so I'm encouraging you and your board to try to bring this. I have some information of more detail, and maybe we can have a coffee and talk more in detail. That's good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next, we have uh, Paul Broadwin. Um, I'd like to thank you very much for this hearing. Um, 
So my name is Paul Grado, and I'm a professor at UWM, and um, I study mental health services uh, locally and nationally. Um, I'm also honored to serve on a, a few uh, mental health reform committees. Um, the, top, the, the largest um, framework for what I want to say is um, something which perhaps the political system cannot help with very much, which is the development of the mental health workforce. So everyone knows that there, um, there are not enough psychiatrists um, working um, with, um, with, uh, in our community in general, and especially with people with severe symptoms um, um, receiving public sector resources, not enough psychologists, um, and it's difficult to get more social workers and nurses to, to go into mental health fields. Nevertheless, um, there is a key promising innovation that I'd like you and your staff to know about if you don't already, which is the peer specialist movement. <laughs> um, so I'm a very strong supporter of uh, peer specialists, and these in short are individuals, as you may know, with lived experience of severe symptoms, often lived experience of um, forced medication, uh, um, Chapter 51 commitment, incarceration, homelessness, who then recover, as many people do, and are trained in a curriculum to um, provide support, emotional and pragmatic support, to, uh, to other individuals undergoing mental health crises who get caught, caught up in these uh, very entangled systems. Um, we know within the peer specialist movement, there is a uh, kind of a new development of so-called forensic peer specialists or re-entry specialists, re-entry peers. And um, this, I think, is very promising. And, and here is actually one, one way in which the political uh, system can, uh, you and your colleagues, can maybe uh, throw some weight behind it. Um, these are individuals who not only have the peer experience, but in particular have um, experience in you know, the criminal justice system, who are then trained especially to work with individuals in, who are at, at the juncture of mental health and criminal justice services. I can tell you from my own experience, my own uh, research experience, that um, public defenders, DAs, some judges um, are very strongly behind this. And I've seen individuals who have been trained informally as reentry specialists do incredibly effective work with other individuals who are caught up in the system. Um, now, there is a, um, uh, 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 the Grassroots Empowerment Project, which is a statewide or, uh, uh, organization, recently received a large grant from SAMHSA at the federal level to develop a uh, reentry peer specialist workforce here in Wisconsin, and um, and I don't know the protocol on, on, on your side of the fence for this, but uh, uh, they, there is a, uh, there has been, has been a listening session once in Milwaukee, once in Madison, an upcoming one um, on February 17th here, here in Milwaukee. Um, I would urge you and your colleagues to support this. Um, you, you know, I'm, again, I don't know quite how this works. Um, send somebody there or, or uh, contact uh, the folks, the grassroots department folks in Madison. Um, to throw some resources and moral support behind this. I think peer specialists are not a panacea. You know, they're not the golden, uh, golden bullet that's gonna save everything. But it is a, um, an important step. And I think actually politically the stars are aligned um, right now um, to move things forward, you know, if, if, uh, if only a few inches. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, next up, we have uh, Jeff Weber. Good afternoon. Thank you for hosting this event. My name is Jeff Weber. I represent the Milwaukee County Chapter of Wisconsin Federation of Nurses and Health Professionals. I am a PhD employee. I've been uh, working there for 20 years. I uh, bring a unique experience to this. Um, I have worked every unit in that hospital, and I actually work out in the community as well. I, too, sign that code of ethics, and I, too, am under the same pressure as my coworkers. I speak not only for my members, but for my coworkers at PhD as well. Morale is at an all-time low at BHD. Just when I think I can't keep saying it, I have to. Safety for patients and staff is at risk due to the inability to recruit and retain staff. The flight of staff started three years ago when the county executive and Hector Colon announced the closure of the Hilltop and Rehab programs. It's difficult to retain staff when they see their top boss 
Hector Colon getting a 39% raise, and if they're lucky, they might qualify for a 1% raise. It's difficult to retain staff when they feel their safety is in jeopardy due to inadequate staffing levels. The county executive and Hector Colon are bent on privatization of services as a cost-saving measure. Eight months ago, BHD changed pharmacy vendors to save money. Our previous vendor would supply discharged patients with the supply of medications to get them to their next outpatient appointment. Now, with our new vendor, patients are given written prescriptions. We often give them the script and they're on their own to get their meds filled. Or we will fax it for them. What we have discovered is that with this new procedure, when one of our patients is discharged to the crisis respite service, we are finding that sometimes their meds are not covered, or there's a problem with this, or there's a problem with that, and it delays their discharge, sometimes for days. These are the ones we know about. We don't know about the problems that our patients have when we give them a prescription and tell them to go to Walgreens and pick it up. The county executive and Hector Colon want to privatize the remaining services at BHD. We at BHD provide a much needed service to this community. We take care of the most difficult, challenging, and vulnerable patients in this community. These patients, these are patients, not a profit margin. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we're coming up on our, on our last few folks. Um, so if anyone has any final uh, testimonies or questions they want to have, uh, feel free to um, get them to uh, our folks up front. And uh, I'm going to stick around a bit later if folks do want to chat one on one. <coughs> so next we have uh, Barbara Beckert. Uh, yeah. So just by way of background, uh, I work for Disability Rights Wisconsin, we're the protection and advocacy agency for Wisconsinites with disabilities. And our priority is uh, protecting the rights of individuals with disability, particularly addressing issues around neglect and abuse. Whenever a closing of an institution occurs, Wisconsin has um, a pretty robust process that is supposed to be in place to convene a team that comes together to plan the closing and the relocation of individuals either to the community or to another facility. And sometimes that process works very well and sometimes it's very rushed and uh, not as effective as we would like it to be. So we served on the closing team for the long-term care facilities at the mental health complex for Hilltop and Rehab Central. And um, you know, based on our experience, it was a very thoughtful uh, plan planning process and a very successful one. It occurred over a process of almost four years because there was a recognition that each of the residents was a unique individual with complex needs and it was important to take the time to develop community capacity to ensure that services and supports were in place to meet each person's needs. Uh, all of the individuals who lived in the Hilltop uh, long-term care units were eligible for family care, which, as you know, is a state program that provides community-based long-term care services. So that meant that Milwaukee County wasn't responsible for developing those services or for paying for them, but the state of Wisconsin, through the family care program and the network of managed care organizations. Mm. A lot of work was done to ensure that the preferences of guardians, of families, of residents were taken into consideration and respected during the process. And that's our role during the process as advocates to ensure that the rights uh, and the voices of the residents and of their guardians are heard and respected. So certainly in terms of the process, we feel that it was a good one. 
and it wasn't easy to develop the community capacity, but we think a pretty good job was done. Um, there were some challenges and continue to be because unfortunately, you've heard the term NIMBY, not in my backyard, mm -hmm. and there have been some very um, disturbing uh, situations where there's been a lot of controversy in the community and there's been a resistance to having people with disabilities relocated in the community. But overall, I think people have been welcomed. We don't usually do follow up to all of the residents when a relocation recur occurs. That's not part of our federal mandate. And honestly, we have very limited resources and there's so many needs. But because this was such a historic closure, and because there were so many with complex needs, we thought it was important to do some kind of follow-up and see how people are doing, and we've been able to get some additional funding to secure that. So we're doing follow-up visits to the residents who are 18 to 59 years old and who live in, in Wisconsin for the most part. Some people are too far away. That, that has been one of the valuable things about a closing like this, that it does give people an opportunity to live closer to family and friends. For example, one resident moved out of state by choice to be closer with family. Some have moved to other parts of the state. And, you know, the visits that we do, we are not a regulatory agency, so it's not like the Division of Quality Assurance that's going out there to make sure that all the regulations are met. We're going out there to spend some time with the residents to see how they're doing if their choices are being honored, if they have a quality service plan. Is everything perfect? No, it's not. But for the most part, what we've seen has been very positive. And we've seen that individuals who've lived in institutions for many years um, are blossoming in the community and that they are achieving greater independence. One of the things that I think is going to be important moving forward is that the family care program, because that is the program that is providing services and supports to so many of the members uh, who used to live in Hilltop and Rehab Central, that it is adequately funded, that it has the right model for serving people with complex needs. And as we know, there are a lot of transitions going on right now with family care. So I would ask you, uh, as a member of the assembly, who I know is on the Aging and Long-Term Care Committee, uh, which has taken a, a great role in stepping up to ensure that there are some opportunities for community input on this to do your best to ensure that that occurs and that there is adequate funding for individuals with complex needs. In addition to that, I think some of the comments that were mentioned about the importance of ensuring that frontline staff have appropriate training um, are very, very important and compelling. And People are, are only going to have as good an experience as the staff who are supporting them. Mm -hmm. And there definitely are challenges in terms of the quality of staff and the training that they receive. So I hope that you'll be an advocate for making changes in that regard. Um, finally, just very briefly, I wanted to mention one of the challenges that we see in the community is the increasing number of people with mental illness who are in the jail, the county jail, and state prisons and um, that's because of a lack of community services and the lack of diversion options. So there are a couple of opportunities with legislation that still could be passed by the assembly this session. Uh, two bills that both would enhance the TAD, the treatment and diversion program, so that we hope you'll take action on these. Um, let's see, I've got the bill numbers here. You probably know them better than I do. AB 52, which could be expanded so that individuals with a, only a mental health diagnosis would be eligible for TAD, and AB 657, which would increase the funding by $6 million a year. So we hope that you will, I, I know you're supportive of these, uh, we hope your colleagues as well will take action and move these forward. So thanks again for this opportunity to hear from the community. Thank you very much. And I'll just, yeah, give a quick update on those. Uh, I completely agree, although I'd say the price tag on the TAD is a little bit of a misnomer because actually you're saving a ton of money by, again, you know, treatment of alternative diversion by diverting people. So um, if any of you live in Republican areas, please let your folks know because that's where the issue is, to be frank. Um, 
So anyway, uh, not to partisan anything up, but uh, we, yeah, we get it. We just need everyone to get it, and it actually saves quite a bit of money. But that's my only two cents on that. Anyway, uh, next we have uh, uh, Reverend Ellwinger. And I apologize, I missed the uh, prayer breakfast this morning. <laughs> Place and certainly uh, uh, this afternoon's focus on uh, people with mental illness is a reminder of the kind of moral uh, position that we need to take as uh, people, as citizens, and certainly as, uh, as people uh, with positions of influence, that namely that persons with mental illness are as important, as valuable as everybody else. Uh, they're not at the bottom of the totem pole, they're not to be forgotten. And so I speak on behalf of MICA and uh, Wisdom, which is the statewide organization. Uh, and there have been three or four references now in the last few minutes to uh, persons with mental illness who got, have gotten caught up in the uh, judicial correctional system, which is specifically what MICA and Wisdom are concerned about right now. Uh, and it's, it's the reality that some 25% of persons in jails and prisons have severe mental illness, and uh, then there's another 50% plus uh, in jails and prisons that have some level of mental illness to say nothing of the 75 to 80% that have uh, addiction issues, and of course there's the co-occurring disorders and so on. I'm glad uh, that my immediate predecessor spoke about the TAG program, uh, but we, because uh, Micah and Wisdom have pushed on this for the last uh, eight years, and it just slowly gets expanded. Uh, but you're right, for every dollar that's spent on treatment alternatives and diversionary programs, we save two dollars. Okay. So why don't we go up to the 75 million that's needed instead of uh, getting, uh, in increasing it from one million to two million and now to hopefully four million. Uh, but we do need to work hard to make sure that the treatment alternatives and diversionary program not only serve persons with addictions and with co-occurring problems, but those who have only mental illness, because they often get lost in the dust, and they need to be a part of that program, especially in Milwaukee County, where our uh, drug treatment courts and treatment alternatives and diversionary programming is big enough that we can, uh, we can do that in some of the smaller counties that might be a little difficult. So I, there are three areas that uh, Micah and Wisdom would especially focus on that apply to persons with mental illness, and the one is the treatment alternatives and diversionary program. Uh, a second area is solitary confinement. Uh, and this is an issue that we have focused on for the last couple of years, and uh, believe it or not, it gotten the attention of, of the Department of Corrections so that now they, they say that they have reduced um, the, the length of uh, solitary confinement from years and 365 days to now it's supposed to be down to 90 days, uh, but we need to continue to remind people and DOC that the United Nations has said that uh, solitary confinement for more than 15 consecutive days is torture. And the sad reality, and I have a personal experience in the back of my mind here, uh, is that uh, persons uh, uh, who often, uh, I, I don't know what percentage of persons who get uh, sent to solitary confinement in jails and in prisons, but it's a huge percentage that are sent there because they have mental illness, they've acted out, and the guards don't know what to do with them, or they get angry with them, and so the way you deal with them is to put them into solitary confinement, mm -hmm. which is uh, the worst thing you could do with a 
person. No, none of this. It just makes matters worse, not better. Uh, and it's tragic what does happen in those solitary confinement cells. So uh, this is an area where we need to get transparency from DOC. Uh, they refuse, uh, they say they don't have the information and the data, which is ridiculous. Uh, every institution has to have a record of uh, how many persons are currently in solitary confinement, how long they've been there, and so on. Uh, legislators should know about that, and they should be able to get that information. Uh, <laughs> Wisdom and Micah have had great difficulty in getting that information, but I think a legislator might have a little better chance, although I'll guarantee you it's not going to be easy. Uh, but that's an area that could make a lot of difference in the, in the lives of some real people who are being ground into dust uh, by solitary confinement. And a third area that really comes to mind is I uh, am a part of the hearing today, uh, and that is, uh, I heard someone say that there's a basic training that you can get in eight days that, what is it, eight hours? Eight hours that gives uh, people a pretty basic, just a basic, but a pretty important understanding of how to assess a person with mental illness and how to act and react and how not to act and to react. And when you think of the number of persons who are dealing with the public every day who ought to have at least that basic eight-hour program to say nothing of uh, some who need more than that, but police officers, POs, POs are notorious for referring persons back to prison simply because they did something because of a mental illness uh, episode and uh, they don't know anything about it, don't care anything about it. Uh, but POs and teachers and uh, guards in prison and law enforcement officers all need to be required. We're finally getting it, but as a society, it's been very slow. Yeah. And uh, somehow, legislation, I think, could do something about this. So I plant that seed in your uh, thoughts and in your, in your plans, because I know you have a concern here. And uh, we'd be glad to work with you on that. Thank you for what you do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And next we have uh, Tish Miner. Thank you very much for allowing people to have uh, a voice and a say. Um, uh, in having, helping you to understand what the big picture is. Uh, because many times uh, legislators and uh, even managers don't. Um, I'm a licensed social worker. My name is Tish Meyer. I'm a licensed social worker. I'm a uh, AODA counselor. Uh, I just retired from uh, working for about 30 years with the Department of Corrections. Um, Mendota Mental Health Institute was where I worked in the civic, commi civic commitment unit. And I worked at Lincoln Hills. I worked as a, um, uh, worked with women in treatment for Department of Corrections. Saying that just to tell you that I do have some background and understanding of what of the mental health area. My concern is, um, well, there are three concerns. One, with the Lincoln Hills situation, where we have 172 um, Milwaukee County residents that have to be um, have to be relocated, uh, but can't be relocated right away because they don't have assessments. They don't have uh, an understanding of what support systems uh, these uh, young offenders will need, um, and that's really bad also because they they have to uh, be a uh, before they come back to the community. I'm also concerned that we're talking about um, DOC has a, has a habit of moving the problem around. You know, there was a problem in Ethan Allen. It wasn't closed down because of financial 
issues. Is there uh, newspaper articles that will tell you the abuse that was going on there? So they moved in the city. And now um, my concern is that they move it back, move the patients, clients, uh, children, young offenders back to this community. They're not going to have the clinically trained people. Okay, you can put people in a facility, put people out at the, the House of Corrections with the House of Corrections staff, but that's the House of Corrections staff. And many of these kids are considered severely emotionally disturbed. And they not only, I understand there's supposed to be 12 people, 12 staff was hired to assess and work with them and place them back in the community. But once they get to these facilities, they still need specialized care. So hopefully they will work on getting clinical supervisors in addition to people that are going to work with the with the population. Um, so I, I and I don't think I, I'm not hearing that happen. I'm hearing that they're going to get staff, but the problem is that you need staff that's aware of the dynamics of dual diagnosis and the uh, the dynamics of working with severely emotionally disturbed uh, children, and also being able to have the insight with uh, transitioning back to family. So they're going to have to have uh, family support, a family therapy background also. Um, there was a mention of uh, peer support um, and uh, specialists, and that's a newly, that, that's a kind of a new evolving uh, discipline. And it combines mental health with uh, AODA. Um, and, it, and it takes people that are in recovery have uh, gone through the experience of recovery to work with families and to work with individuals in terms of transitioning them back and helping them uh, support them uh, in continuing in their recovery. And that's a really important, uh, uh, that's a really important support person that I need, we need more people that are involved in that. My understanding is that right now there's UMOS or uh, I think that does uh, have peer support specialists, but we need more peer support specialists. Um, the other thing that's happening with, uh, with peer support specialists is that they do combine those two uh, backgrounds and if they have the forensic pro uh, program also, that would be great. Uh, my concern is, is that um, the people that, the, that the job uh, pool that people uh, come from, that we have to come from, is not diverse enough, okay? Um, many times you have people coming from uh, clinical, back, uh, have a clinical specialty, uh, specialty, but actually the law a long time ago said that your work workforce should reflect the people that you provide services to which means um, at one time the state had a program called Minority Training Project. And it was part of the old, uh, it was part of the, uh, well, it, was, it still is supposed to be part of the of health, Department of Health, uh, but it's not being funded. And it's a training program that specifically worked with minorities that were in AODA, being trained to be AODA specialists or AODA counselors so they can get their additional, so they can get their um, um, hours, supervised hours, because there are people in um, at MATC or two-year programs for AODA specialty, but the problem with uh, many minority people that I speak to, some of the colleagues, is you can't get your specialized hours, you can't get your, you can't get your uh, clinically supervised hours. And a minority training program uh, used to uh, provide and bridge that service. Um, it's in the books, it's in the law as I understand it, but it's not being funded, okay? So the minority trade, I'm on the uh, State Council on Alcohol and Drug Abuse also, which uh, is part of the, uh, the Department of Health. So we are talking about that. There is supposed to be a workforce uh, committee that's part of that that's being reactivated. So we're working on that. But we need uh, the legislators to come in and reactivate that program because you're also going to have you're going to have a lot of people out here 
without uh, the treatment, uh, people um, that are trained in treatment and understanding of the population. Um, I'm also concerned that, there's one, one more and that's it, I think. <laughs> I'm also concerned that um, hopefully if we have psychologists work with, um, psychologists work with uh, our, our families, the families that are coming back to the community, that we need to make sure that they are, have uh, experience in addictionology, um, which is specifically working with the conditions that are brought about by um, addiction and being an addict. Um, there's a, a real, it's a real specialized area and we need to make sure that um, many, the psychologists, if they're going to work uh, with people with mental health issues, that they definitely understand uh, the addiction part of it and um, that they um, understand what needs to be done. done. Um, also, please, please, please look into this. The two people I've seen that I talked about, they can't speak because of a code of ethics. Now, I, I have to sign AODA ethics. I have to get paid for my license. I have to sign, I have to sign um, uh, the uh, social work licensing ethics. And part of the, the, part of the whole field of social work has, is part of is, uh, social justice. So you can't be, you can't <laughs> be bound, you know, if you're a, uh, a, an advocate for social justice. And most people in, in the clinical field are, because they're the people that see the patterns right. that are happening in communities, and they're the people that can put it in uh, a language that your legislators or other orga organizations can interpret and, and work on. So I, I don't understand what this gag law is or gag, gag rule is. It doesn't sound like it's legal to me. Thank you. You're doing a great job. Almost, you're doing a great job. Almost done. Thank you very much. And um, we have Lisa Demon up next. And uh, one more after her. Thank you, Representative, for your time this afternoon. My name is Lisa, and I'll share my experience briefly. I have lived in three different states throughout my life. I was born in New York and spent most of my childhood and adolescence there. I am the second in the family who is deaf. I have a sister also deaf and two hearing siblings. Most none of my family learned to sign until uh, my parents later became divorced and my mother remarried to a different gentleman and he actually uh, lived in Vermont so we would often visit them often and would have long journeys and my mother would actually use me as an interpreter for my other sister because I was able to communicate a little bit easier with my mom than she could. So it was a huge burden for myself at a very, very young age to be responsible for interpreting for my mother and for my sister. I do also have a mental health uh, experience as well as some domestic violence concerns um, going through a divorce. I had sent, uh, gone to a counselor. Uh, there were no drug and harm training and certified counselors at the time, so it was option to have to go through sign language interpreters. Uh, no matter where I was, I had also moved to other states and experienced the very similar things. I am on depression medication until, still until this day. I do hear, see a counselor who can hear, uh, who I could sign. I felt that the connection was better, but not as quite as good as speaking to somebody with my own native language. I have not been seeing a counselor here uh, simply because I felt there were not adequate services here and that really hit me hard for my experiences in other states. I'm obviously doing quite well now and I thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, and I was just wondering if you could uh, 
talk a little bit more about the experience, uh, the differences between even having, I know, um, you know the counselor is hearing, but having a counselor that could sign directly as opposed to working through an interpreter for those services. During my time in New York, I did have a counselor that brought in an interpreter. But I really felt that affected the bond that needs to be developed with a professional counselor. Often it focused a lot more on making sure that the interpreter was fluent enough to understand me and was getting my message clear. And also it tended to take a lot longer. So that would often, we'd have to work through the interpreting process and it really focused less time on my treatment experience. My counselor who was able to hear did have some awareness of sign language, but missed the deaf culture aspect. They didn't grow up like I did. They didn't truly know what it was like to be a deaf individual in the world. So often they would bring another individual who was deaf involved that didn't have the experience, but I also felt that that didn't truly adequately meet me where I'm at. So I think having a deaf professional with the language and the culture really meets my needs as best we can. And oftentimes I'm going to be more time educating my therapists than actually getting treatment from them. Thank you very much. And, oops, sorry. and uh, finally we have uh, Jeanette Aliano. So there have been a lot of struggles with being there, creating support groups and programs and not being open 24-7 because that's not our mission and that's uh, a mission of uh, other organizations. Um, but we are there to support and we are there to listen. And we had a very dear member of us, uh, for, uh, from us. He would come to groups, he would come to support groups. He came to programs, he was ready. He, we saw that he was in recovery. Uh, he was getting services at the time with Salvation Army. And he was also living with a dual diagnosis, getting treated for his mental health. But yet, uh, once the holidays came, things just spiraled down. Having the office closed and not having services open 24 seven for him created isolation and loneliness. Uh, so he began to drink. Some of the regulations with Salvation Army to be in one of their programs is, well, you, you can't drink. And if you do, and if you do three strikes, then you're out. Uh, that happened, and on the third strike, he wasn't able to seek the service anymore. He had his housing there, and he had programs there. They transitioned him to sale or service access to independent living, and he was getting a, a caseworker at the time. Again, it takes around 30 30 days to even go through that intake, from what I know. Um, so, during that time, again, it was still the holidays, we would have support groups here and there, um, but there was nothing else that was able to give him that support, that community support that he was craving for. There were organizations that were open, maybe like uh, from four o'clock till eight o'clock in the afternoon, and to even be in CRC, you have to stay there for a day. You can't mm -hmm. come and see someone for like an hour, right. which it would be great to have someone to be able to go there if you don't need to stay there all day. Right. You just need to talk to someone. Um, so at, at that time of being a part of a cell, they, were, they, they gave him a worker to work with, a caseworker, and uh, he began his process, but uh, that, that caseworker, then was no longer with the SEAL program. They, they left, they ended up leaving. So he got into a, a, another dilemma, which was his caseworker left, now he has to get another one. And there was nobody giving him that support, those services, the community support program. Uh, he drank himself to death. There was a 
the community that he created with our groups, with our programs. There were people that were looking for him, and yet uh, we, we weren't his caseworkers. We, his uh, community, his support group on Saturdays was there for him on Saturdays, but they didn't have access to his address or to his phone number. Uh, they ended up, his uh, new caseworker ended up finding him dead. And that was the first visit that they had. <laughs> and so uh, it's going on to basically uh, coming back to if we're not taking care of dual diagnosis and saying it's not just mental health and it's not just a person living with uh, substance use or alcoholic. Uh, alcoholism, it, it's both treating both things at the same time, as well as uh, providing access 24-7 to a community support program, not just having it from 4 to 8, and not only for people that can stay there for a whole day, because sometimes we only need to have someone to talk to us for just a while, just an hour, just two hours. It, it saves not only a person's life, but it also saves on costs. It saves like, people. It creates communities. This is affected the rest of our members. It's created a stronger group with our support group. But why does that need to happen after someone has passed away? Uh, we have also gotten several calls uh, from family members and from individuals living with mental health issues on the issue of medications because of the switch of their insurance or them losing their in insurance, then it takes uh, a about a month. I, I usually hear that it's about a month for them to get transitioned into some kind of bad care or services. And so then they're left without a month of no prescriptions. And if they have to pay out of pocket, it's from 300 to $600. Again, it's like, you were to go get your insulin, you can go get some insulin, but why can't you get a medication that can also save your life? Um, um, that is all I have. Thanks. <clears throat> thank you very much, and uh, thank you for all the great work you do, um, Jeanette. And, uh, you know, we're uh, coming to the end, and I just wanted to uh, thank everyone very much for being here. I know we had a lot of people come and going throughout the day, and um, a lot of uh, really important information shared. But I also just um, want to say how thankful I am to everyone for helping to create a safe, open, honest space for dialogue and for uh, expressing this important information. And it's helpful for me to hear from, from you guys, from the experts, from you all, but um, I also think. Uh, to a certain extent, it's helpful to hear the broad spectrum of uh, services and issues that we're dealing with in this community. Um, and I think there might have been people who, you know, all, we all live in the same city, we're all, you know, working on the same issues, but may not have even met before. So I'm glad we were able to be in the space together. Um, as I said, I want to have more of these sorts of conversations. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll follow up when the time comes to. Uh, you know, let you guys know when that happens. But uh, again, I just want to thank you all very much, and thanks to my team for being here, and to all the great work, and to uh, our interpreters today, and uh, to you all. So thank you very much, and look forward to continuing the conversation.